Response, it makes you feel good. All right, so good afternoon. Thank you all for that lovely welcome. Uh, I am Sarah Rosen Mortel, and I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and also of welcoming you all to, here today on behalf of our co hosts, the uh, American Action Forum, and their president, uh, who you'll hear from in a few moments, Doug Hawkeekin. Uh, thank you for joining us for a conversation on the role of risk mitigation in stabilizing individual health insurance markets. Um, recently, AAF and Urban co-hosted a day-long roundtable summit of leading national experts from uh, the academy, industry, the actuarial community on this topic. And today we're releasing the findings from that summit. Uh, this is a nice quiet week in health. <laughs> Uh, so not much else going on, but uh, actually a pretty important time to be talking about stabilizing insurance markets and addressing rising premiums. Clearly, affordable, stable premiums are at the front of the conversation that we're having on the front page of the paper and in everyone's Facebook feed and everywhere else uh, in America today. Um, uh, working with AAF, uh, Urban has uh, focused together on one of the overlooked aspects of the health insurance debate, the role of risk adjustment and other risk mitigation policies to achieve some of the goals that we're all talking about. In fact, you'll note an interesting line in our brief that we are releasing together today. It says on the last page, risk mitigation issues are rarely subject of entertaining dinner table conversations between ordinary humans. What I think that means is that we're in a room full of extraordinary humans, and uh, those of you who have chosen to spend your afternoon with us uh, on this uh, show a uh, great uh, um, distinction. Um, here at Urban, actually delving into wonky and complex topics with great issue experts, all with the mission of elevating the debate by bringing facts and evidence to bear, is kind of what we do. Um, we strive to provide policymakers with the information they need to do their jobs well, and I know that's a shared mission that we share with the AAF. This topic is no different. The paper we're releasing today explores and analyzes the current risk mitigation measures and also how policymakers can structure risk mitigation to function more effectively both in the current individual market and perhaps under future changes to that market that now are the subject of a little small debate happening uh, down the street. Um, but we can't afford, forget that in the midst of our discussion on this complex topic of risk and actuarial science, really what we're talking about are people's lives. Behind all these numbers are real people who are seeking health care, and both of our organizations do the work we do because we believe that evidence has the power to improve people's lives. As we move forward on this complicated subject, we hope you will join the conversation. Um, perhaps put the emails aside for an hour, but you are free to use those devices to broaden the conversation as it uh, goes on uh, social media. And join us on Twitter. If you are one of those who can simplify this topic to 140 characters or a simple mem, you are amongst the very best. And you may join us in using the hashtag uh, RA Health Stability, um, which is up on the board. Um, and you'll also find on your program the handle, speaker handles for all the people who will be on the panel so you can share your thoughts and reactions as the conversation goes. Um, to lead uh, the panel that we're going to hear after a brief presentation of the upshot of the, uh, the workshop uh, is our partner Doug Holseekin, who is president of the American Action Forum, a good friend of uh, not only mine but of the Tax Policy Center and the Health Policy Center and a lot of the good work here at Urban. 
Um, Doug has held some of the top posts in government, including as chief economist for the Council of Economic Advisors during the George W. Bush administration, director of the Congressional Budget Office, a nice, quiet, non-controversial shop as well. Uh, he served in the Academy at Columbia and Syracuse Universities and as campaign policy advisor for the McCain presidential campaign. Um, I want to take the opportunity to extend a special thank you to them for bringing uh, and joining with us on this project, and we really uh, appreciate it. We also want to thank Anthem Inc. and Eli Lilly and Company for their support of this work that we've done together. But first, we're going to have Urban Zone Stan Dorn present the findings from this recent summit. Um, and before I introduce Stan, I just wanted to take a, a, a moment of personal privilege um, to just say a word about Stan. As those of you who are in this field may know, Stan has uh, spent a full decade at Urban, uh, but has recently decided to join Families USA to bring his analytic skills and knowledge of health policy to one of the country's leading health consumer advocacy groups. He's worked on health policy issues at the federal and state level for more than 30 years, especially on strategies to enroll the eligible uninsured into subsidized health coverage. We've been pleased to have him as a colleague here and done all kinds of great and important and influential work. Uh, and know we will continue to work with him throughout, uh, as we do many uh, across the uh, policy spectrum. And we wish him very well and hope that is a rewarding place for you that is uh, all you could wish it to be. So thank you for your hard work, Stan. And we look forward to hearing about the upshot of the summit. Stan Dorn. so much, Sarah, uh, for the kind words and for setting the context for today's discussion so beautifully. Uh, this has been a remarkably uncertain period for the individual health insurance market, and it continues to be uncertain. So we structured this project to try to be helpful to policymakers regardless of how the great national debate turns out. Um, as those of you who can see this, read this slide, we'll recommend it. If you can read this slide, I envy you, and you should just leave right now. Um, we had an amazing combination of national experts who came together in mid-May from the academic community, from the actuarial profession, from industry, and from the Hill to look at these often obscure but really critical questions for making sure that we have individual health insurance markets that are stable with insurance companies that participate and offer choice and with premiums that are relatively affordable. Um, the questions that the panel looked at um, included what are, what are the main lessons learned from the past use of risk mitigation measures? How can risk mitigation be improved so that it functions more effectively in the current individual market, if that's what we stay with? Or if the market changes, as proposed in Congress and is being discussed in the administration, can risk adjustment, risk mitigation measures be changed to function more effectively and help that individual market work better? But we did not talk about what's the right approach to the individual market writ large, ACA versus other, some of the alternatives. Rather, it was sort of a, an engineering discussion. If Congress winds up with this kind of car, what should the carburetor look like? If Congress, if, Cong if we wind up with this other kind of car, what should the carburetor look like? The carburetor being the risk mitigation measures that keep the car humming smoothly as it goes down the road. Um, the, the issue brief that we've released today I, uh, tries to articulate some of the perspectives of the assembled wise people who came together in May. It doesn't talk about the points of view of either the urban staff or the, AA staff, the AAF staff that worked on the project. And I just want to say it's been a real joy to work with the folks from AAF and a uh, real lesson in when, you, when people of goodwill come together across different perspectives, uh, you learn a lot and the upshot winds up being better than when you could have done on your own. So it's been really a pleasure to work with, with, uh, with Doug and his team. Um, the four panelists who are assembled for your listening pleasure this afternoon came to the, the summit and so they'll keep us honest. Um, we're gonna, uh, much of what I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is about definitions because what we learned is that well-informed people can use the same words to mean very different things. And if we wanna uh, communicate clearly, it's important to make sure we're defining our terms. So even when it comes to the, the basic issue of risk selection or adverse selection, as it's often termed, there are three really different forms that risk selection can take. One is risk selection against the market where people decide whether or not to obtain coverage based on what they think about their likely health care costs. And sicker people tend to join, healthier people tend to stay out. The problem there is that risk levels in the market rise and premiums are high. 
A very different problem occurs in the second form of risk selection, and that's risk selection against an individual plan. In that situation, you have somebody who's already in the market, they're going to get coverage, but the decision about which plan to select is based on how that individual assesses their health needs. And so you may wind up with a plan being selected against Lots of sick people sign up with that plan, perhaps because of the benefits it offers, or the provider network, or other factors. And if the premium revenue is not enough to support the claims of that high-cost group of enrollees, the plan loses a lot of money, which leads to the third form of risk selection, namely risk avoidance by carriers, by insurance companies. In, in, in a situation where you enroll one person, you make money, you enroll another person, you lose money, you enroll a third person, you lose a lot of money, then a lot of effort goes into making sure, not that you do good service and offer good value to consumers as a primary objective, but avoiding risks. And we want the insurance market to function like a good market, like you know, smartphones and, and uh, you know, other, other markets where people are trying to offer value to consumers, not trying to avoid, not spending their effort trying to avoid one group of consumers or another. And in this situation, if there's carrier risk avoidance, then high cost consumers who are being avoided may not get their needs met. Because whichever carrier meets their needs is going to find itself swamped with costly people. So, uh, uh, and so what that means, and sort of less picking up on Sarah's point about human beings, it means the people who have health problems may ironically be the ones not able to get the health insurance that they need to address those problems. So those are all problematic forms of, 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 of risk avoidance. Um, now there's uh, risk avoidance and other risk selection. Now we have four main risk mitigation measures that have evolved to address these problems. And they all play some role in the story of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or ACA. The first is risk adjustment. And this is the only one of these measures that continues to be a feature of policy and that was designed as a permanent feature of the ACA. Risk adjustment compensates plans for the difference between the foreseeable risk level of their members and the premiums that the plan charges. So for example, if your insurance plan attracts a lot of people in their 50s and 60s with asthma and heart disease, and my insurance plan attracts a lot of you know, guys in their 20s and 30s, you know, people like, like uh, and I say guys because women have higher costs because that's women get pregnant, uh, then my plan is going to pay money into the risk adjustment system because my premiums are going to be high relative to costs, and your plan is going to get money from the risk adjustment system so you can meet the needs of those older people with diagnosed chronic illness. Uh, and the objective is to make it possible for plans to succeed across the spectrum of risk. No matter who you sign up, you have enough money to do your job and not too much money. That's the goal. Reinsurance is very different. It addresses unforeseeable risks. It addresses those few outliers, sort of freakish occurrences of very, very high cost people hit by a car, who, who are, incur uh, you know, rare illness or what have you. And the idea is, if there's a consumer whose costs exceed a certain high threshold, which is termed an attachment point, reinsurance pays a percentage of the claims above that attachment point. And that way, you as a carrier know that your risks are not unlimited. If you wind up, in, just by chance, enrolling a bunch of people who turn out to be really, really costly, it's not going to destroy you as a company. You're going to get some help with that. And so the goal here is to make it possible for carriers to offer coverage, and to reduce the need for carriers to charge extra premiums to protect themselves against risk. Very different form of risk mitigation measure is risk corridors. Um, both reinsurance and risk corridors were operative during 2014 through 2016, the first three years of the ACA's main operation. Risk corridors, though, never functioned quite <clears throat> as intended because of some legislation that passed after the ACA was enacted. But the idea behind risk corridors is as follows. If you as a plan have losses that depart from a target level by more than a certain percentage, or you have profits that depart from that target level by more than a certain percentage, then you either pay back some of the excess profits or recoup some of the excess losses from the risk adjustment system. Now you may ask, why in a, in a capitalist economy we, we do something like that, you know, capping profits and losses, or at least limiting them? Well, the idea is, if you have a brand new market, like we did with Medicare Part D, or a radically different market, as took place with the individual market in 2014, carriers may not be able to price their products very accurately because they don't know what the nature of this new market is going to be. They don't know what the risk level is going to be. Should I charge high premiums because it's going to be sick people or low premiums because it's going to be healthy? And risk coordinators tell plans, don't worry, if you make a mistake pricing your products, your losses will be limited. And so that encourages carriers to offer coverage and, again, lessens the need for carriers to charge extra premiums to guard against risk. 
The fourth risk mitigation measure was used a lot before the ACA and under the ACA was used during the years up leading up to 2014, and that's high risk pools. High risk pools take high cost individuals defined in terms of their chronic conditions and move them out of the risk pool for the general individual market. They go into plans where outside resources, public resources typically, pay the plans supplementing the premiums so to cover the extra claims costs of those high cost individuals. If high risk pools work is intended and there's enough money to support their operation, then people with serious health problems can have their needs met through those plans, the subsidized plans, and the rest of the market has its risk level lowered because the very sick predict people with predictable health care costs are outside that market in the high risk pool instead. So those are four different measures. Um, some of the points that were made in the summit, I'll, I'll talk about it, and some of our panelists will, I, I'm sure, mention other points. One is that risk adjustment is really important, and it's really hard to do well. If you don't do risk adjustment well, then plans avoid certain groups of consumers, wholesale, and those consumers aren't going to necessarily get their needs met. Plans may stay out of the market entirely if they feel that risk adjustment isn't working properly. I mean, the problem, the limited success of risk adjustment in meeting the needs of people who enroll mid-year were cited by many insurance executives as reasons why they dropped out of the ACA uh, exchanges. Uh, and premiums can be too high, premiums can be, it can be a problem, and it takes a lot of work to get it right. Federal officials have worked incredibly hard to try to make the system work, and it works pretty well now, but it, but it will require continued effort and continued staff investment of resources on the part of the federal government if the market remains as is, or perhaps even more so if the market changes. Now, if the market remains as is, one interesting idea that emerged from the summit that I wanted to pass on was the following. The, a potentially prioritize shifting risk adjustment from the current zero-sum arrangement to a guaranteed arrangement. What does that mean? That means that today, risk adjustment just moves money between plans. Plans that have healthier people than the average in the market pay money to the plans that have sicker people. The problem is it's unforeseeable to a plan. Are you going to wind up paying a lot of money, getting a lot of money, paying money at all, getting money at all? Very hard to predict, introduces instability and, and questions. If it's guaranteed, as it is in the Medicare Advantage program, you as a planner pay based on the characteristics of your members, regardless of what happens to other plans. So that would stabilize the market some. Uh, in terms of changes, a couple things to keep in mind. One is that transitions, if the individual market changes dramatically, it may be important to think about something like the risk order program that was originally intended, so that plans are, uh, offer coverage despite uncertainty. Uh, and if we wind up in a situation where states are very different from one another in terms of the benefits that are covered, in terms of the actuarial value of the plan, which is the percentage of health care costs the plan pays, then you're going to need different risk adjustment rules in different states and different risk mitigation measures. And it's hard to do that stuff right and, and big problems result if you don't do it right. So that's going to be a technical problem going forward if we make big changes. The final thought I wanted to pass on is in the form of a question. Many people think of externally funded uh, risk mitigation measures as ways to bring down premiums in the market as a whole and encourage the enrollment of young and healthy people. Well, if your goal is to encourage the enrollment of young and healthy people and you have a finite amount of money to accomplish that goal, is risk mitigation the best way to spend that money? Is the most effective way in terms of getting young and healthy people into the market to pay plans for taking care of sicker people so they can charge lower premiums? Or would it make sense to invest that money? Would you get more bang for the buck if you used it to, to, to increase subsidies, to pay for outreach, or to pay for application assistance? With that question, I will leave you and turn the conversation over to our amazing panel for, uh, for wise and wonderful insights. Thanks so much. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate uh, that this house is so full on this topic. Um, I was afraid people might think it was a lifestyle seminar for a post Trump world. Um, uh, I want to repeat some things that have been said already. Uh, my respect and admiration for the ongoing uh, enterprise of the Urban Institute, its research programs, and the collaborations that I've had with them in the past. And, and this one in particular, we want to uh, reciprocate the thanks to Stan and his team. This was a spectacular uh, collaboration. We really got a lot out of it. Um, we want to thank uh, Eli Lilly and Anthony for their support. Uh, this is a 
this is a topic that has uh, tremendous import for the actual context of public policy, but it's not exactly the sexiest topic, no matter how much we try to dress it up, and the fact that they were willing to uh, help us uh, undertake this, I, I really do appreciate it. And I want to thank the, the panel for taking the time to do this, not only to come to the original event, but to come back and share their insights. And uh, going from that side to this side, we have Kate Bundorf from Stanford University, uh, Tim Layton from Harvard University, Corey Michello from uh, the Ameri uh, the American Academy of Actuaries, sorry, and John Kaling from uh, Centene Corporation. And uh, what I thought we'd do is we'd give each about five minutes of opening remarks to set the stage, and then I've got a couple of questions for them, and then we'll open it up and, and let the audience uh, ask questions as well. So why don't we start with Kate? Yeah? Why don't we start with John? <laughs> I can't hear it. The moderator, they've already revolted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just got here. Go. <laughs> no. We're going to say Kate the last. Hi, everybody. I'm John Cannon from Centene Corporation. And first, I also want to thank the Urban Institute and, uh, and Dennis Organization for inviting us and Anthem and Lily really for sponsoring this uh, really important topic. And um, I was glad Sarah actually made reference to that last statement in the report saying that this was not an exciting dinner conversation because I actually think it is pretty exciting. I think <laughs> I've been working uh, on risk adjustment issues uh, for about 20 years uh, and uh, I think it's been fascinating to see how risk adjustment has evolved as a really critical financing uh, component of uh, the Medicaid program and Medicare Advantage and now we're seeing how it's evolving in the private market, so it's super important. And I think the topics today, Doug and, and Stan, and her, are uh, fantastic. Um, let, let me just tell you a little bit about Centene um, to kind of frame our perspective on some of this. And I'm going to channel between our company's uh, experience with this, but also my uh, experience having worked on this in the academic institutions and in other organizations. Um, first, our company. Many of you may not have heard of us, uh, but we're a uh, pretty big insurer. We're actually uh, have six million individuals in the Medicaid program with contracts with states, and uh, we have over a million members in the marketplaces in the states. Uh, so we're, we're among the biggest in, uh, in these public uh, markets. We've had significant growth in the marketplace business since 2014, and at the end of 2017. Uh, open enrollment. We now have about 1.2 million members, and if you do the math, that equates to about 10% of the whole market, uh, which we're uh, uh, very proud of. Um, and we've also publicly stated our commitment recently to staying in the market and trying to uh, be a successful partner with uh, various governmental entities. Um, what we've done is we've grown in a very disciplined fashion. We focus on our members, we focus on, it's a pretty complex program uh, that uh, Stan was mentioning, lots of different moving parts in it from a financing and a rate setting standpoint, but importantly, our sort of defining feature has been focusing on our members and creating affordable products, and that's why our membership has, uh, has expanded. And because our roots were in Medicaid, um, we've been able to see a lot of members in that so-called churn population where people's incomes change they um, uh, to stay with us, keep the same doctors and, and those kinds of things. Let me now just make a few comments uh, about, uh, uh, about the uh, individual market and risk adjustment. One of the things that I've observed over the last several years, and it just comes home in this debate over and over again, is we don't have one national market on the individual market. We have 51 markets, and arguably, by rating area, rating regions, we have multiples of that. So it's really important, I think, to recognize that the dynamics of local um, networks, com competitive situations, unit costs, all those things come into play. And um, we have to be careful then in evaluating any of these financing mechanisms to, to not overgeneralize and really think about in a particular market what effect does a risk mitigation or a risk adjustment system or some other factor uh, play uh, into this. So we'd be careful not to generalize. Um, and as I said, as noted in the report, Stan made some good comments opening up. Let's not ask risk adjustment to do more than it's supposed to do. It's working with an overall contact with a, a specific set of goals. And um, one of the things that, and this is channeling my, more of my personal experiences with this, is really recognizing that 
fundamentally, the risk adjustment mechanisms are really trying to measure the illness burden of a particular plan. Do I have healthier or sicker members when I compare that to other plans? And how do I adjust payments among those plans? And we do it by measuring um, in, in very sophisticated fashion as we, um, the illness burden of these plans. And that kind of lets me pivot to my next point, which I think, uh, again, Stan, you teed up well in your opening comments, which is this is, it's, it's relatively hard. And why is it relatively hard? Well, there's a lot of moving parts. We've got um, very elegant and sophisticated models, algorithms, with fancy names, ACPs, procedures, other things, that calculate these illness burden scores. And they're wonderfully elegant and effective, and especially when you're working on a desktop and a spreadsheet, they really are elegant. But what we have to realize is that there's a, what I call the supply chain of the data. Uh, from the time a person sees a physician or a healthcare provider or doesn't see someone, to the time that code is collected, to a medical record, to a claim, to an encounter, to the edge server, there's lots of areas where that data can get interrupted or uh, not uh, accepted. And to the extent, especially in the budget neutral environment, where I am um, relative to other plans on the payer or on the receiver, uh, this is a really big deal. Lack of coding. Uh, coding completeness can make me look healthier, can make another plan look less healthy, and transfers can be as a result. And the last thing I want to mention, because I see my, my signal here and that's kind of time, uh, the last thing I want to mention in terms of lessons learned is um, the, uh, the challenge in the marketplace, um, and Stan alluded to this in his opening comments, is when we think about Medicaid in particular, Medicare Advantage well, these grew out of legacy fee-for-service programs. We had a very specific understanding of unit cost and networks and, and really a very highly developed fee-for-service program that platformed into some of the managed care. Um, and also, importantly, um, scores, your risk scores, are often known in advance of the year, so you can plan and budget accordingly. One of the challenges with the marketplace is you as a plan need to estimate a year and a half in advance of when these transfers are going to occur. Am I going to be healthier than the overall average? Am I going to be a receiver? Am I going to be a payer? If I'm going to be a payer, how much? If I'm going to be a receiver, how much? And this is, requires a lot of business acumen. And as the program matures and we have more experience, it's going to be easier to do those things, but in really which is a problem for less sophisticated plans. And I'll leave you with one uh, important date in two days, the Friday, June 30th. CMS will publish the 2016 transfer amounts that some plans will pay, and in some cases it could be hundreds of millions of dollars, and some plans will receive uh, payments as well. Those are for the 2016 year, which is now six months old. So it's just sort of that thinking about the effectiveness on the ground of how these things work, and the need to make sure that we're very careful from the forecasting. So with that, I'll wrap up and turn it over to our next colleague. Would it be okay with the panel for you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thanks to Doug and Stan for leaving this effort. And I also want to note that I am an Urban Institute alum, so I'm especially happy to be participating today. So what I'm going to do is build off of some of what Stan was talking about, really focus it on the relationship between risk adjustment and pre-existing condition protections because those protections are fairly meaningless if insurers don't want to actually cover or enroll people with health conditions. So when premiums aren't allowed to vary by fully by health status or other factors that can affect health spending, the risk adjustment program helps make sure that insurers are adequately, appropriately compensated for the risks that they're bearing. Otherwise, as Stan said, insurers are going to want to avoid some of these high-cost people. And in other words, then, the risk adjustment program really helps support these pre-existing condition protections. Now, whether risk adjustment is needed really depends on the individual, uh, the, the market rules. So in terms of premium rating rules, risk adjustment is needed less when insurers can vary premiums by health status or other factors. But it's needed more when there's community rating. In terms of the issue rules, 
risk adjustment isn't really needed if insurers can deny coverage or exclude the existing conditions. However, it's more needed when there are guaranteed issue requirements. In terms of benefit rules, risk adjustment is needed less when there are um, benefit requirements that are uniform. Uh, it's needed more when there are differences in benefit coverage or benefit generosity. So what's that mean for the types of changes that are being discussed to the market rules? Well, one uh, provision or, or rule that's being discussed is loosening the rating rules. What well, the issue, the, the rating rules are loosened, as I mentioned, risk adjustment is needed less. However, if the guaranteed issue requirement remains, then it's still important to have a risk adjustment program. And there's an important issue that arises with, with regard to the guaranteed issue provision, and that's if a segment of the population, say those without continuous coverage, are required to undergo underwriting. Well, a big question that arises then is, are people who are underwritten, are they in the separate risk pool or the same risk pool as everyone else? If they are put in a separate risk pool, then what that effectively means that the people who are not underwritten, who have community rating, their premiums are going to go up because that pool without the risk adjustment is going to, to be less healthy and higher cost. And the reason that is, is risk adjustment transfers <coughs> payments between plans in the same risk pool, but it doesn't transfer payments across risk pools. <coughs> so in terms of benefit design flexibility, eliminating or loosening the EHP requirement really increases the need for risk adjustment. But at the same time, it makes risk adjustment a lot more difficult to implement. So risk scores, for example, could understate, underestimate health spending for people who choose optional benefits. And that could discourage insurers from offering benefits that aren't required. So in effect, or eventually what can happen is optional coverage either becomes very expensive or not available at all. So again, this undermines pre-existing conditions protections for those who have, uh, have, have high cost conditions either at enrollment or even if they develop such conditions over time. And finally, we also hear about things like extending association health plans or allowing the sale of insurance across state lines. Those kinds of activities would really increase flexibility and exacerbate some of the risk adjustment uh, problems I talked about because they would make more flexible the rules about issue or rating or, or benefit rules. So again, those kinds of provisions could really undermine some of the pre-existing condition protections. And my turn. Um, so I come at these questions, you know, from academia, from every tower, and if you don't understand how the real world works, but. Um, but I want to paint you a little picture of what the academic literature on risk adjustment looks like. And the way it looks is mostly focusing on these underlying predictive models that are used to you know, predict people's spending and then determine these transfers across plans. It's a huge literature um, that has done amazing things to make sure that these models are kind of as powerful as possible given the li limited information that we have. Such that today when we get to this point where we're implementing risk adjustment in the marketplaces, you know, that's a technology that's well established and we don't need to worry um, about, about that piece of this problem. And instead, there are bigger kind of conceptual questions about how to do this that, that have been left kind of unanswered, especially in a place like the marketplaces that's, that's kind of unique in some special ways. Um, and one of the key ways that the marketplaces are, are unique or different from the other markets where we've used risk adjustment in the past being um, Medicare Advantage and, and Medicaid is that people can opt out and they do opt out in, in the individual market. They choose not to be covered. And in addition to that, there's very wide variation in what insurers can offer. You can offer, you know, a, a set fee can offer a, basically a Medicaid plan, or you can have you know, a, a very narrow network, a commercial plan, you can have a wide network PBO plan, you can have a plan that's owned by a hospital, you can have all kinds of uh, options. And these things you know, make the marketplace a very different place from these other, these other markets. And, you know, when people can opt out, when you have this heterogeneity, 
it brings up kind of an underappreciated trade-off that you didn't really think a lot about before. And this trade-off is that is a trade-off between what economists would refer to as intensive versus extensive margin selection. And let me tell you what I mean by that. By intensive margin selection, I mean the problem of the sick choosing more generous coverage within the coverage, the set of options available to them. And by extensive margin, I mean the sick being more likely to buy coverage at all. Right? Um, so there's two margins here, purchase insurance, and then what insurance do I purchase? And it turns out risk adjustment works you know, on this intensive margin. It transfers dollars across plans. It transfers dollars from kind of these uh, perhaps lower generosity, advantageously selected plans, plans that attract healthy people, to maybe higher generosity, um, adversely selected plans that attract sicker people. And so when it makes these transfers, effectively what it does is it you know, raises the prices of the low generosity, advantage advantageously selected plans, and it lowers the prices of the more higher generosity, adversely selected plans. But the key here is that it raises the prices of the low generosity, advantageously selected plans. And you know, when the young, healthy person is going to the marketplace and saying, do I buy coverage or not? That's the plan they're looking at, right? They're not looking at the very high cost, kind of high generosity plan. They're looking at that bare bones, like cheap plan. And now it costs a lot more than it otherwise would have if we didn't have uh, these aggressive transfers. And to make it clear, these, these are big transfers coming across these plans. If you look at the actual dollar flow, you could see that if we didn't you know, do this, let's say we took it away entirely, then the plans that are paying into this pool could effectively price a lot lower. Um, and so this, this brings up this trade-off that we often don't think about. Um, and it's especially important when the subsidies that, that are used on that kind of low price well, really on all the plants are, are deemed kind of insufficient, they're not big enough, and the mandate penalty is not strong enough, it's not, not intense enough. And when, when that happens, there's a real decision we need to make, which is, you know, are we risk adjusting too much? Um, because as we do more, we really force kind of some people out of the market. And, you know, you may say, well, we have subsidies um, for, for the people on that end, but you need to also remember that the risk pool here is not just the marketplaces, it's the entire individual market, which is much bigger than marketplaces. Um, and if you look at the entire individual market, there are a lot of people that are not subsidized, and those people end up you know, facing these higher prices due to these policies. I'm not saying that you know, we don't want to do this, but it, there is a trade-off here, there is a connection between how much you do within the market and how, what type and how many people you have in the market. So that's something that we've been thinking a lot about a lot that is very different from these other markets. Um, that will continue to be important as we move forward, given you know proposals to reduce subsidies and to kind of expand that that space of available contracts. Great. Um, so I guess I'll finish it up here. Um, so I just want to make kind of a couple maybe overarching comments or make some broad points. And uh, my first point is essentially I, I think risk adjustment is here to stay. And, and why do I think that? Well, it, it turns out that these problems of adverse selection that we're talking about, those are problems that are actually created by, by policy, right? So when there were, um, you know, when the, uh, those uh, other economists in the ivory tower were uh, sitting around thinking about their Nobel Prize winning work, you know, the major insight that they had about adverse selection was, well, when people are out there in the market um, buying insurance and they have more information about their health risk and their likely health care use, if they have more information about that than the insurers do, that creates these big problems for insurance markets, right? So the problems are that um, insurance markets can be very unstable, insurers are going to try the things that Stan talked about, that, that insurers are going to try to alter the policies in ways that encourage certain types of people to enroll, high risks uh, less likely to enroll, and that reduces the value of the coverage for high risks. Okay, so, so that was in a market that didn't have very much regulation. We have a lot of regulation in our health insurance um, markets, uh, both within and out of, the, uh, out of the ACA. In the individual market, you can think of uh, a set of policies that actually create adverse selection. And those are policies like guaranteed issue, guaranteed renewability, um, coverage of pre mandatory coverage of pre-existing conditions, 
restrictions on insurer rating practices, the insurer's ability to actually use the information that they have about people um, in setting premiums. Those are policies that actually create these problems of adverse selection in um, health insurance markets. Um, those policies, as we have seen through the, uh, the existing debate, at least a subset of those policies are likely to stay. Why are they likely to stay? stay? Well, they're incredibly popular with consumers, with the, with the public, and they're popular for good reason. They make health insurance more uh, financially accessible to people who are sick and need, and need medical care. And, and maybe even more subtly, they provide people with the protection against the risk of becoming a bad risk. Right? So, so those are very popular policies. So, so I, think, I think the way to think about it is, okay, we have this set of policies that create adverse selection insurance markets. Now we need a set of policies or a set of mechanisms that will alleviate these problems of adverse selection. And the core of what we're talking about here today is the sure risk mitigation mechanisms, um, the risk adjustment, you know, the uh, risk adjustment, uh, um, the reinsurance, and risk adjustment, reinsurance, risk orders, audience, risk orders, <laughs> <laughs> you get less stress. There, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've got these uh, risk mitigation strategies. Those are key policies for addressing this problem of adverse selection. But we have, we have another set of policies on the table, right? So we've got subsidies, we've got open enrollment periods, we've got mandates, um, basically things that are restricting the ability of consumers to make decisions about health insurance based on their health risks, right? So, so they're, they're, they're offsetting sets of policies. Okay, so, um, and, and I think this underlies some of the comments that the, that the various speakers have made, that we have to kind of think of them as a, as a set of policies, and they, they can work together. If we lighten, if we, uh, we may create more risk selection on one side of the market through a set of policies, and we want to think about having offsetting mechanisms to address that problem of risk selection. When I think about um, risk adjustment in particular, um, and look at the, the, the direction or the types of policies that are on the table, um, I think this idea that, that, that Corey really focused on of um, as we broaden, and Tim as well, as we broaden that product space, as we allow insurers to make um, uh, different types of plans, you know, broaden the range of actual <coughs> values, broaden the range of benefits that are required uh, to be covered, uh, even broaden um, the types of uh, you know, uh, managed care mechanisms that different plans are using, narrow networks, utilization review, financial incentives to providers. As the product space gets broader, it gets harder for risk adjustment to do its job. So I agree with Corey that in some ways risk adjustment is more important in that context, um, but it's hard for it to carry all the weight itself. Right? So in that context, we want to think about well, what, is, you know, what, what can we do with um, uh, what other policies can we put in place to kind of complement um, the, 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 those uh, potential effects of making a more um, robust and broad uh, product space. Um, and the final point I want to make, um, which, which I actually think is kind of the elephant in the room um, in terms of uh, the healthcare policy, risk adjustment all the way through healthcare policy, is that healthcare is really expensive in the U.S., right? So when you look at that, the, the numbers coming from um, the most recent uh, uh, CBO estimates for um, a 64-year-old person with a five-to-one rating band. I think the um, average premium is sixteen thousand dollars, right? And this median income, the median household income in the U.S. is something about you say about fifty thousand dollars. That is a lot of money, right? So the fact that the premium is sixteen thousand dollars for the 64-year-old is not really a problem of risk selection. It's a problem of health care being very expensive in the U.S. So what can we do about that? Well, we basically have two, two policies on the table. We can subsidize, so you know, someone else can uh, help people pay for their coverage, um, or we can, we can focus on mechanisms to control healthcare spending. And when I say control healthcare spending, um, as an economist, I'm all about value, not just you know, reducing spending, but trying to focus on high value care, get rid of the low value care. Um, but I think that uh, you know, we, we always have to keep that in mind. Um, as we think about the effects of policies in this market. Thank you. Um, I really want to pick up on this issue of the, sort of the history, what have we learned from the Medicare Advantage, Medicaid experience, and in particular, the things that surround the risk adjustment, the, the other mechanisms in the network, the, network, the, um, the coding rules, things like that. What do you think is your the takeaways from that history of how would things work differently if we learn from that and change the internet? I'll start out. A um, couple of couple of thoughts, um, and I'll build on some of the things uh, that we just described. In the marketplace, we do have a fair amount of variation in terms of network, um, unit cost, 
uh, those kinds of factors. Um, and to the extent our transfer mechanism, we were talking about how some plans have to pay other plans, those get brought into the mix on that. And those, I think, um, can, um, can create uh, a bigger challenge from a, from a forecasting standpoint, and maybe even from some of the policy solutions. Uh, as Mr. Justin the best policy solution on that. The other thing is um, the, the markets, um, in Medicaid in particular, where I've done a lot of work, um, we're, we're seeing, in a lot of cases, very big, mature markets. So in, in Florida, plans will have um, 300,000, 400,000 members. So there's a big membership in the risk pools, the, the big risk pools, uh, and the mature programs. And importantly, the scores are known at the beginning of the year in these programs. So you have a better idea. I think this later in the year, um, creates in, in, in the market that's less mature, that's created some, some challenges that I think are not going to be I think one last thing that's kind of related to this is that risk adjustment can't do it all. Like it can't be the only mechanism that helps reduce incentives for insurers uh, to avoid I think it can do a lot, but it's not perfect. It will never be perfect. It, it can, it, even when it's running well, it does create within the mechanism some of the incentives. So I think it needs to be paired with other types of rules that also make sure that, that insurers aren't doing discriminatory policies in terms of their, their networks, their formularies, their benefits. Like that because I think those kinds of rules you don't want that to be too restrictive because you want to have plans, give plans the flexibility um, to, to you know, do mechanisms that work and can reduce the cost um, to, to get it so, you know, to manage their care well, but you want to make sure they're not doing that by doing these other things that, that avoid uh, them enrolling some, some of the high cost people, but they don't necessarily do a good job in uh, managing that. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what we've learned from Medicare Advantage and Medicaid is largely that, that in those heavily regulated environments, that it can work. The risk adjustment seems to be able to work reasonably well um, at distributing risk and limiting insurance. And it doesn't mean that you've got rid of all the incentives. It doesn't mean that insurers don't act on the residual incentives. But it seems, you know, I mean, you see, uh, you see, like, as often like a diabetes plan now, or you do. That insurer would want to enroll diabetics, right? Um, but I think like within highly regulated environments, it works. I I don't want to go so far to say that outside of like the highly regulated environment, it doesn't work. I think we just still don't know um, because we've never really tried it. Um, the marketplaces really do represent kind of our foray into that area, and I don't know that I called the data in yet. On, on how well it's working out, and we've been able to like, evaluate it super well at this point as, as to you know, how bad these problems are and, and whether insurers are responding to the residual incentives that, it, that are there. And so, so I think, yeah, I, I, I'm just not sure yet in terms of whether it works. I think I'm just going to do a little infomercial for some of the teams that are research here. Uh, so, Tim has some. So, so, so the point I want to make is that risk adjustment can make, can create, especially in these heterogeneous product markets, and especially when we're thinking about across different pools, as Corey talked about, across different states and geographic areas, as we all probably know and experience, spending is very different across different areas in the country. Um, risk adjustment can create some kind of crazy and perverse subsidization, um, uh, and cross subsidization schemes. And I think that in many of the studies, or some of the studies that Tim has done, he and his colleagues have really kind of pointed out you know, how these uh, cross subsidizations um, actually can play out in using data and simulating um, different types of policies. So, um, so I think that the, you know, the, in this setting, um, the individual market where there is a greater variety of products and lots of different markets and less regulation, you know, risk adjustment can, you know, can have some unintended consequences um, you know, in the setting. Um, so one of the kind of take a step back, what, what the issue is here is that in the marketplaces, the way that the transfers are structured, you always have to base the transfers on kind of a benchmark plan or benchmark cost. 
And in the marketplaces, the way what was decided is that we're going to use the average premium in the market. It's not entirely clear that that's like what you should do or, or anything like that. In Medicare Advantage, it's like the, the county level benchmark payment that's sort of equal to like the fee for service class for the county. And Medicaid is just whatever the state like says it's going to be. Um, and the question is that you know, using this average premium in the market, what does that do to the market? And you, it's pretty straightforward to see that you know a low cost plan ends up paying in more than they think they should to the to the pool because the average premium is higher than their cost. And the high cost plan doesn't get enough according to what they think they should be getting to compensate them for, for their cost. And you know we've done some work that suggests that if you have a budget neutral. Uh, this is a policy. It's actually impossible to satisfy both plans using that budget neutral policy. But what comes out of this is the question of like this benchmark payment, what you set it to. It's it's an important kind of normative question as to where you should set it. The higher you set it, the higher you set that payment, the more you're benefiting more generous plans in the market. The lower you set that payment, the less you're benefiting more generous plans in the market. So the question is, you know, do we want to support the, the more generous coverage, the more generous plans. And we always have to recognize that, as I talked about in my opening remarks, we do so often at the cost of the market itself and you know, driving people out of the market itself. And, and so these are issues that we that were initially kind of grappled with in kind of an ad hoc way, but you know, we like averages, we'll just say the average. Um, but there's needs to be more of a recognition that that matters a lot where we set that kind of benchmark payment and moving forward, we, as you think about various reforms, you need to think about whether we want to emphasize generous coverage for the people who get coverage, or we want to emphasize coverage. I want to work, uh, I can't resist to jump in that, um, on that a little bit. You well stated, I want to tweak that a little bit with a couple of nuances. Um, one is um, what, what Tim is referring to is this, is going to get kind of Walking with this so-called statewide average premium, you need a you need a time to, to to make these adjustments. In Medicaid, it's super easy. The state has one uniform rate. It's a 1.0 rate, and maybe it's a hundred dollars per member per month for a, a, a young child, and plus or minus is how that works, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, in the marketplace, we've got a couple of issues, and one is that plans have very different networks number one, and that in and of itself shouldn't be a problem if my network is drawing because I have a particular specialty hospital and I'm going to get more uh, particular patients with uh, high cost needs, the risk adjustment can measure that and can adjust in the transfers, you know, in a plan that's got, let's say, less specialists might uh, be a payer in that. that. That's doable. The challenge comes is we're measuring health status at one equation but then fundamentally, the networks have different costs. So there's also a unit cost difference. So a particular teaching hospital, in addition to um, you know, drawing a particular member of it, has a different unit cost. And the risk adjustment is, is really operating on both of those um, in, the, in the marketplace. And this has become an important regulatory issue. And a lot of plans uh, have worked um, with CMS, actually. And, and the, the rule for the markets for 2018 is they're going to actually tweak that anchor premium and they're going to say, well, we're not going to do anything about the unit cost, you know, the benchmark part of that, but the plans, um, they're going to have a, 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 an adjustment for the administrative cost that plans have. So we don't want to finance and transfer to inefficiency of administrative costs. So we'll just recognize you know, sort of the unit cost. So it is a really big deal. And again, for the reasons that were stated by the panel, we have a lot more of this variation of marketplace than we do on, on, the, uh, on, on Medicare and Medicaid. And it's good to see the regulators and the industry and the Association of Actuaries and the NFC have all taken on this. And we're seeing what has happened in the other programs too, which is we learn, we evolve, we improve. And I think those changes for 2018 will go a long way to, uh, to improving the operation. So it seems pretty clear that the environment matters a lot, but there's also just doing the risk adjustment. Um, are there things that jump out as things that are being weighted too heavily in the current risk adjustment approach, or the flip side of that, are there things that ought to be put in there that, that are not in there right now, and, and what are the challenges going forward as we think about doing the risk adjustment? The risk adjustment probably is already changing. Right. right? And it's, 
already this incorporating. Is your, this is your chance to write the one of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about uh, better when not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about what's in the regular. Yeah. Okay. So it's got, I'm not forgetting where it's going to go into that. But one, one big thing that we're doing is incorporating prescription drugs, right. diagnosis from, from prescription drug data. And there's, on one hand, that it's good because it'll bring in diagnoses that maybe weren't already captured through the medical clinics. On the other hand, you don't, you know, prescription drugs, um, given one prescription drug, it can be used to treat different conditions. So you want to make sure that you're not affecting prescribing behavior or, 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 or giving something a higher weight because you think the condition it's, that drug is attached to is a really high cost condition when really it's not. So there's some, some issues there, so I think that's why uh, CMS is starting slowly in terms of incorporating which uh, diagnosis they want to include. But I think it's important to kind of monitor that over time and see if that it's appropriate to broaden that or not. I, I think there, uh, underneath uh, correspondence, I think there's a really big picture, interesting underlying question, right? And that's um, on what population do you, and this is something we talked about in the panel, but if I'm, if I, we have really interesting con um, uh, comments from all the different uh, folks on the panel. On what population do you base the risk adjustment model? Right. So if you think about Medicare Advantage, the risk adjustment model has traditionally been based on uh, traditional Medicare, and that's um, that, that's saying something strong, right? That's saying, uh, well, we believe that we want to kind of you know, build in or create opportunities for improvements you know, based on how traditional Medicare is delivering care. Um, so we have similar issues in the context of the exchange. So my understanding is the model was built on basically employer-sponsored health insurance, um, you know, relatively generous plans um, for uh, people with, uh, with you know, who are working and have relatively high incomes. And um, so, so the risk adjustment model is built on that, so that's what plans are shooting for, right? So, so interesting questions come up as, well, should we change the risk adjustment model to reflect the, um, uh, you know, the use data from the individual market and develop a new risk adjustment model? It might be very different, but it would also embed you know, whatever uh, inefficiencies or, uh, you know, or you know, good things or bad things that are happening in the individual market now, right? So I think that is you know, kind of an interesting underlying question. Yeah, I think a great example of that is this is a real example, but you know, let's say that the risk adjustment formula is insufficient in terms of what you know, cancer and the insurers respond by just like, making it very difficult to get cancer to care for cancer. Then when you go and estimate this risk adjustment model on that market, people with cancer look really cheap, right? And because they can't get any care. And so if you go and use that for the payments that insurers get uh, for, for having somebody who has cancer, then that just really embeds kind of that selection of the efficiency in the market that was already there. Um, but I think that Corey brought up like, an important issue with respect to the, the drug, using drugs uh, in, in this way. It's something that you know, we've talked about a lot for a while. Some European countries do this. I mean, it brings up another bigger issue, which is that, you know, we could get rid of this problem entirely by basically just reimbursing insurers for what they do, right? Then there's no selection problem anymore. They don't care if they get a sick person. They don't care if they get a healthy person because they get reimbursed. John Hodges. Right, yeah. <laughs> John would be very happy with that, right? I mean, obviously, that's not something we want to do because there's a trade-off there. <laughs> I don't think I would, I would love to make John happy. <laughs> But I think Centene actually wouldn't be that happy in the market because they lose their competitive edge. Um, but but so so it's easy to see that you know there's there's one really easy way to fix this, which is by you know reimbursing on cost. And you know using drugs in the formula is to some extent a lesser version of doing that. Right? We're now paying insurers more if people take certain drugs, right? And that does change the incentive for insurers for people to take certain drugs. And so we want to be really careful about when we do that type of thing. Now, that said, under the current system, you get 
a payment if somebody gets a diagnosis code from going to a doctor's office visit. That already embeds incentives for insurers to get people to go to the doctor or if you're on Medicare Advantage, you don't even have to go to the doctor, they'll send one to you to make sure you get your codes. Um, and you know, we just need to be cognizant of this trade-off that, um, that when we do risk adjustment that's based on things that insurers can influence, whether it is drugs or whether it's codes, that we build into the system incentives for the insurers to change their behavior, and sometimes in costly ways. In terms of drugs, it's clear that there is a cost, a social cost, to insurers you know, being more lax on you getting the drugs that are in the formula. With coding, it's a little more subtle, but turns out to be a much bigger issue. Um, if you Google CMS HCC, which is the name of the risk adjustment model used in Medicare Advantage, I think the first 10 pages are companies that will help insurers you know, get their codes, right? Um, and it turns out that this, you know, you shouldn't think about this in terms of like insurers being devious to try to get these scores or whatever. It's really something that's imposed on them by this risk adjustment system. And it actually, in some ways, is a burden to them in that if they don't do this, they can't compete in the market. They don't get, you know, the payments that they need. And it just provides an incentive for them to spend a lot of money in a way that has kind of dubious <coughs> social value. Um, and it's not like it's their fault, but it's it's something that we need to think about as a potential cost of these types of policies. I want to I want to just um, broaden out. It's it's not just about revenue and risk adjustment in a, in a good regulated environment that we have certainly in, in Medicare Advantage and uh, Medicaid. What you're seeing is that there is um, all kinds of quality ratings, the stars ratings in Medicare Advantage. Uh, and in Medicaid, most of the states now have some kind of quality, either bonus or penalty. So what you're finding is a lot of the plans are actually incentivized partly as revenue, but partly as making sure that we do have that visit so the person gets um, treated or gets um, uh, appropriate uh, care for say, diabetes so that um, they get the care they're supposed to get and it counts towards the quality bonus or the or the stars program. So I think we need to think about these sort of, you know, in the broader context of how the regulators are operating in. And, and certainly I think we've seen tremendous uh, response by the industry, certainly in Medicare and Medicaid where you look at some of these scores now and uh, and the private plans actually are beating future service in, uh, in a lot of areas. So part of it is can I just follow up just for a second, just to make sure I understood what you said? It, it, it sounded like you thought some of this was socially wasteful spending. <laughs> make sure I didn't <coughs> mistake that. But, but what it sounded to me like is we don't, we are not given by, by the heavens the health status or the health cost of an individual. We have to discover it. It's costly to discover it, and that seems like a valuable thing to do. I mean, the risk adjustment might be inducing people to go discover people's health status. I mean, we should do that. So, did I hear wrong? No, I, <laughs> that's why I use the word dubious. It's uh, <laughs> definite. Um, but I, I think, though, that you need to think about what is actually going on here in terms of that's, that's actually producing these scores, what the insurers are doing differently from what could be done otherwise. And on the one hand, yes, like going to somebody's house and you know, giving them a checkup could have some value. Um, it doesn't mean it does, but it could. Um, in a lot of other cases, this is not you know, doing anything different to the person, but doctors are always writing down diagnoses, right? And they're always writing down notes when they have visits. Just those don't always appear on the plane. And so what a lot of these firms do and what a lot of insurers are spending a ton of money on is actually converting the stuff that is already there into something that they can then submit for payment. And that turns out to be costly, and it's unclear that that actually you know, benefits the consumer. So we've talked about it in general, but I wanted to sort of just sort of ask you to sort of specifically talk about the challenges that would be raised if we saw some changes to the individual market, in particular, uh, things like uh, essential health benefits differing across states, giving them options to do that. 
What does that do to the risk adjustment sheet? What do you have to worry about there? Like I said, I think it makes it much more difficult. Even if you have a state that, so say the um, law regime to say, okay, states, you can make up your own essential health benefits or, or not have them at all. Um, but say a state decides, okay, we're going to have a set of required benefits and it's, it's less comprehensive than what's uh, required today. And plans would be allowed to offer benefits above that. So the things that are typically thought of as being left out of subsequent benefit packages include things like mental health, maternity, um, sometimes prescription drugs, uh, those kinds of things. Well, what happens is it becomes really difficult to know, to, to estimate what someone's spending would be for covered services when that set of covered services is small. And one reason is because codes or, or diagnoses that you're, you're capturing from these other types of services, now you're no longer getting. And so you might be understating someone's physical. So for example, if someone has um, mental health issues and mental health services are not covered, well that person could have higher, not only mental health service costs, but also higher other medical service costs for, for whatever reason. And the claims of, of that person may not completely reflect all the diagnoses or claims that contribute to those higher medical costs. So it can become more difficult than to, to get the right estimate of, of how the, the spending for those covered benefits would vary uh, across the insurers. I think this makes the problem that Kate was talking about earlier just more severe in that when you think about you know, where should we estimate our model? What's kind of the benchmark? Um, currently, we're doing it in employer plans, which actually, actually works reasonably well because the essential health benefits are effectively based on employer plans. Um, but if we kind of move to a world where we, you know, say, took mental health out of, uh, out of the, the bundle, um, then we, you need to make a decision as a policymaker, you know, do I only include the essential health benefits in the data that I use to estimate the risk adjustment model or not? Um, and if, you know, if I leave the mental health that spending when I'm estimating the model, then insurers may have an incentive still to provide mental health benefits, even though they're not in the bundle. But if I take them out, then the insurer no longer has that incentive because the people with mental health conditions don't induce higher payments anymore like they did before. And so I, I think in some ways it just transfers the burden of like deciding what benefits are needed or important from whoever, whatever policymaker who may be here uh, decides on the bundle of the EHBs versus to the technocrats, like the, the data nerds that are deciding exactly how to crunch the risk adjustment numbers. And so you still have to make the decisions just at a different place. So we're going to move the audience Q&A. Um, so uh, prepare to know your name, your affiliation, and ask your question, and then form a question with a question mark at the end. Um, but before we do that, since Stan is leaving Urban, and we wish him so well on his new venture, uh, we have to answer his last question. So briefly, if, if you're down to the last couple of dollars, you have a choice between risk mitigation me mechanisms, or another way to, to affect the extensive margin, like recruiting people, where do you spend your money? Okay, you finally have to open. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I'm just going to say, I don't know, I have to do a study. <laughs> God bless you. In the ivory tower. <laughs> I think that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have an opinion. My, my opinion is that it shouldn't be in the form of reinsurance um, because that is effectively a subsidy for, to an insurer for enrolling sick people. But we think the problem in the, market, in the individual market currently is that there aren't enough healthy people enrolled. Um, effectively, you get more bank your buck, uh, which is phrase that Stan used, which I think you may have stolen from me from the summit, um, by either, by either, uh, Citation war later. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you this is my job, right? Citation war. Confidentiality. Sorry. But yeah, it was Tim. And But I think, you know, it's more vague for you, but by either a uniform subsidy to everyone, or a subsidy that's more targeted to these people that we want to enroll uh, to the end and help people with it. I need to see 
We'll get you a moment. <laughs> and I have two comments. One is I wish I was back and I could do that. <laughs> the, the, the second is, uh, on a serious note, um, I, I would say um, we have 51 markets plus, you know, and I think the tools and solutions are going to be much more localized. So I wouldn't want to do that once. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, going to come back and, you know, now that I've had four pounds to think about it, um, I, I just want to say that I, I think this question is uh, related to the last point I brought up, and, and that when we're talking about when we talk about all these risk mitigation strategies, we are really talking about two things. We're talking about how can we prevent you know bad adverse uh, bad outcomes from adverse selection in the insurance market, and how can we subsidize low income and high risk people, right? And and I think it helps to when you're thinking about different policies to disentangle or at least to try to clarify what your objectives are. So uh, the floor is open. If you do have a question, raise your hand. Wait for the microphone to come. And as I said, uh, identify yourself, uh, your affiliation, and ask your question of the question. And if you want to direct it to a particular panelist, please do so. There's one over here. Uh, I'm Bob. It's on Bob Berenson from the Urban Institute, and my knowledge of risk adjustment is largely in the Medicare Advantage context. I think you. You've correctly identified this coding issue as an issue. I think it's a much bigger deal uh, than, than how the panel has treated it. MedPAC estimates that uh, without adjustments, the payments to plans would be about 10% more based on just their coding intensity. Uh, and while one view, the benign view, is that it's just correctly identifying what's out there, uh, the Justice Department is suing four Medicare Advantage plans, including United Healthcare, for under the False Claims Act for uh, intentionally fraudulent behavior. I have no idea if these allegations are correct or not, but it is probably the leading challenge in Medicare Advantage right now is this coding issue in, that, in, uh, in risk adjustment. So and your question is? is? You agree. <laughs> And it's directed to? I'll start with Tim, but anybody. Well, I wrote my dissertation on this, so I guess it should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that this this is a major issue in Medicare Advantage. It's probably also a major issue here. Um, since this is not about Medicare Advantage, I'll talk about it here. Um, though I think we think in Medicare Advantage, it's kind of my view that um, much of the problem is, is not the fraud, um, and this carries over here, but instead just these incentives that are given to insurers to um, really make sure that everybody has all their codes, whether you want to call it correct or complete or whatever, just to spend a lot of money on coding. Um, and I think that it's just something, you know, there's a trade off here, like, there always is, and like your problem is always left to identify, is that you know we can ident we can uh, we can observe somebody's risk really well uh, if we use a lot of variables that are kind of endogenous or that insurers can influence. We can observe risk less well when we restrict ourselves to variables that insurers cannot influence. And the question is, you know, where is the sweet spot in terms of you know? how much insurers can influence. And the, the diagnosis-based risk adjustment is clearly, you know, probably better than reimbursing insurers for like 50% of what they do. Um, but it's not clear that it's like the best way to go. So we just need to think more about the link between insurer behavior and the codes. And maybe there are better ways to get signals of risk that are, are less prone to kind of insurers being able to, to do anything about it. Next question. Is mine. Okay, go here first. Trisha Beckman, Big Read, Big Read Illness. Um, if any of the panelists is familiar with the um, New York Risk Adjustment Program um, in a small group market that might be extended to individual market, um, could you explain whether I think it's a good, good idea to offer some of the um, some of the large transfers that are um, in, in, you know, embedded in the risk adjustment model on the federal side. 
that that is a really a very detailed question. Um, so uh, I'll I'll try to explain the what the question is. Um, what what they did in the New York market on the small group side only. I don't mean the big one. Correct me if I don't have this right. Is they said that the size of the transfers among plans would destabilize the market, right? So they kind of limited those transfers and they made it in effect non pleasure neutral. Really big deal from a policy standpoint, and uh, they made a decision that they thought it would, um, you know, uh, stabilize the group market. We don't operate in that state. Um, I have some familiarity with that. I can't say any more than that. But the panel and the, and the paper did talk about should risk adjustment be budget neutral or you know, should be uh, sort of externally funded. And then obviously the question would be if it's external, then where does the funding come from? Okay. Here. Uh, I'm not sure how to frame this, but... Um, Can identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry. My name is Meredith Woody. I'm from the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, you briefly touched on quality metrics um, and what uh, Tim just said here about, you know, the duty of social value and uh, how the issue isn't fraud but incentives to correct codes. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, quality rating programs um, are, you know, I guess... Uh, Attributing to these, uh, a lot of people putting on their codes and the link between those, and um, I guess the outcomes that you see coming from that. I'd like to, yeah, and this is John, I'd like to thank you for asking that. I'd like to clarify a little bit more. I don't think we want to leave the audience with the notion that this is just about coding and chasing codes. And um, <coughs> one of the things that CMS has done in the context of the marketplace is they've, um, implemented a pilot for a quality rating system, too, or actually must be here in the marketplace. And that has a whole variety of uh, HEDIS measures and other measures to really do what they've done in Medicare Advantage. So when you go to the website to pick your plan, you'll see a, you'll see stars, actually, three stars, four stars, you know, based on maybe, and I worked on this last fall with, uh, with a couple of states, um, uh, maybe 40 different you know, that, that well, some of these involve making sure that people get appropriate care after hospitalization. Some of them involve somebody taking aspirin at a certain level, at a certain age, um, if they've got a heart condition. A whole series of things. So plans have an incentive from a market standpoint, and this is where the government regulations and I think the marketplace align nicely, which is you're going to get a higher star score, and people will look at your plan differently if you do these things. Well, to do these things involves looking at gaps in care. So you can look at our claims data and you can say that John hasn't been for his annual physical. You know, we've got to get him in. And we have to make a phone call to that person. And we have to then, you know, encourage him to go. And then when he goes, he may have other conditions. And, and this is how these quality systems work. And I personally think it aligns nicely because the plans are being pushed to provide quality and they have to invest in these systems um, and they serve multiple purposes. You know, you're going to get coding from risk adjustment on that as well, but you're also going to um, potentially save, you know, cost and you're also going to, in the competitive market, have your plan score higher than your competitor. And isn't that what we want? You know, you're talking about taking value, you know, we want encourage plans to provide uh, value. So I see it as a much more, I see the ecosystem of this being much bigger, and I, I want to make sure that we all appreciate that uh, in this uh, discussion. You want to read it? And from Wayne, <coughs> excuse me, Wayne Young, Report of Harlem Magazine. Could you speak up a little bit? Okay, I'm from Wayne Young, Report of Harlem Magazine. And I may have missed this point. It's about uh, the basis of government risk adjustments, specifically uh, who creates the programs, so under the Affordable Care Act, the, the, for the individual market plans and small group plans, it's the, uh, the federal government who, well, states have the option to implement their own risk adjustment plan. Um, but all the states except Massachusetts decided to let the feds do it. Massachusetts subsequently said, never mind. <laughs> um, we're going to go back to the Fed. So, um, 
so for this program, um, it's it's with the, the federal government through CMS is is administering the program. Um, but that brings up another issue regarding this more state flexibility. If if states differ, like right now, the rules are pretty much uniform across the nation. Now, if 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 that's loosened so that states can vary by their rating rules, their issue rules, their benefit coverage rules, that all of those things will affect the risk adjustment program. And the question is then, well, at some point do states just have to administer their own or can the, the, the federal government try to do something that accommodates most, you know, some of these different combinations? I think it's really unclear uh, because it's, it's really, a lot of work, very expensive to administer these kinds of programs. So uh, you don't necessarily want all 50 states in DC to have to have to do it all. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susanna Gross, and I work for the DC Council. Uh, my question is. Um, how important of an indicator is the number of insurers that are in, a, um, in an individual market? We hear a lot about areas that only have one insurer. Does this um, mean that they have uh, an unhealthy market in some way, or does it also, um, and, and like, what is the risk that you'll have zero insurers in the marketplaces that only have one insurer currently? Thanks. John, do I have this? Certainly, where is the question? She's around behind the back. Certainly, um, this has been uh, received a lot of public uh, you know, uh, press, uh, the potential for what are uh, so-called bear counties. Um, in 20, uh, the year that we're in now, uh, our company um, was asked and we stepped up in uh, Maricopa County, actually, in, which is Phoenix, a huge metropolitan um, area. And uh, they are the, the single insurer there. Um, in, uh, in that particular county. Um, we're seeing through press reports that everybody can read that there are challenges uh, in uh, some states and some counties. It sounds like, in my reading of this, they tend to be um, uh, some of the more rural, and that may reflect more the delivery system. I know they've got a big challenge in Nevada right now where um, they've got really the Las Vegas area and uh, uh, one other metropolitan area and then a lot of rural areas. So it's hard um, to develop networks uh, in, uh, in those areas. You may not even be a delivery system. So I think it really depends, again, I hate to keep saying it depends, but I think it really depends on um, a particular uh, uh, county or, or, or uh, local health care market. Risk adjustment is really easy on this one. But, but I do, to pick up on um, those points, I do think that um, I mean, kind of the, the whole reason we're doing this is to promote competition among plans because we think that you know, that will lead to um, you know, better care and lower premiums um, for consumers. So having only one plan is a little bit you know, problematic from that point of view. It seems good to be the insurer in the market with only one plan, right? To not have any, any competitors. Um, I, I, I do agree with your points that it. It does seem that it's more rural areas, right? So, um, you know, if there are or more sparsely populated areas, so having one plan in more sparsely populated area seems to be better than having no plans in more uh, a sparsely populated area. And the risk that we're worried about, obviously, is that the plan will charge very high premiums and that will be expensive for consumers and for the government. Um, but if that's in sparsely populated areas, it's not as big of a deal as it's in you know, major metropolitan areas. And I, I think we need to understand a little bit better the mechanism behind why there's only one plan in these areas. I mean, you, you could think about a situation where you know, in rural areas, there are a few providers, which give the providers a lot more market power than the insurer. It makes it difficult for the insurer, especially an insurer like Sendy that does a lot, uh, that does very well at kind of uh, negotiating low prices with a, a narrow set of providers. Um, to, in order to give people a, a really cheap product, that's very difficult in a rural area where you don't have multiple hospitals to kind of uh, negotiate with. And so in those types of markets, it may be that you know, it's, it's just difficult to get the prices, to get the price down to the point that people in the individual market are willing to pay, which it turns out is pretty low according to you know, some estimates that people have done recently. Um, 
And so, so we just need to understand better why there's no insurers in those marketplaces so that we can you know, do the right thing to get them in, which might not be the conventional wisdom the conventional approach. Going around, sir. <laughs> uh, just a quick question since uh, I'll take advantage on reinsurance uh, there's a lot of there's a large private reinsurance market Mark Warren Buffett will sell sell your reinsurance what's the advantage of just not relying on the private market for insurers to get reinsurance a private insurer reinsurer is not going to reinsure someone in a, in a plan that they already know is so the private reinsurers are only uh, reinsuring against the unexpected side of the risk, not the known side. Um, can I add something? So, so I think that is, um, I, I totally agree with that, that they, I think they are different mechanisms. So reinsurance is for unanticipated high expenditures, and risk adjustment is more for predictable high expenditures. Um, you know, there, there is an important distinction between private reinsurance and publicly funded reinsurance because publicly funded reinsurance introduces a subsidy. Uh, private reinsurance is just is going to be passed on to consumers in the form of premiums. If there are no more questions, uh, I want to again uh, thank everyone and I wish you to join me to thank panelists.